slave in Africa and being in servitude in Africa and Europe. He talked about when he was in servitude in Africa, the people, the Africans who had him in servitude, they treated him like an extended family member. They treated him with the, for a certain level of humanity and dignity. And he said once he got to the European slave ships, their slavery was something totally different. He'd never been beaten before. They were beaten on. People were getting raped on the ship. So he specifically stated how barbaric the European slavery was as compared to the African servitude. We have people. What's going on, people? I just got back from seeing um, Hidden Colors 3. Um, I'm tired as hell, but I want to go ahead and put this out there while, while I still have it fresh in my mind, but my thoughts might be a little scattered. Um, I was expecting this to be a good movie, but I was surprised to see that it was actually a lot more powerful than I thought. It was. This was a very, very powerful film. I have to give all the props to Tariq Nasheed for uh, putting it together. I saw Hidden Colors one, um, and I, 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 I was I applauded him for that effort on part one too. I thought that was a. Um, a very inspired task he took on to make that documentary. Um, I, I might quibble with some of the, some of the the claims in it, some of the information, but I, I thought it was I thought it was pretty good. But part three is like part three was another level. Uh, the production was better, um, and the fact that it was in theaters, the fact that it was in theaters, uh, really really enhanced the experience of it. It's a different it's a different vibe watching it in a, in a movie theater than it is watching it um, you know on your computer or on television at home or something like that the energy in the theater was was really really good um, I, I think that were this movie like in 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 movie theaters proper like in, in advertised like um, like Godzilla or, or X-Men or something like that if it was like a main if it was mainstreamed in movie theaters like that and a bunch of people saw it it might actually have sparked a revolution right then and there, which is why you would never actually see it in a movie theater like that. Um, but it was very powerful. It dealt with um, white supremacism and and how you can identify it because it, it's, it, it stressed something that I try to tell people all the time, which is that white supremacism is is not what you think. White supremacism white supremacism is is invisible. It hides. It's not out in the open. And um, and when I say white supremacism, I'm not making a mistake. I, I mean to say white supremacism. I know you, you usually hear people say white supremacy, but white supremacy would mean that white people are supreme. White supremacism would be the belief that white people are supreme. So that would be a more proper term. The system is founded on the belief that white people should be supreme. So therefore, those who are not white are oppressed within this system. But this is not accomplished through overt means, or at least not anymore. When people think of white supremacism, they think of Klansmen in hoods riding around on horses, burning crosses in people's, in people's lawns. But that's not how it works anymore. White supremacism is not a Klansman on a horse today. White supremacism today is finding something that black people do, passing a law that criminalizes it, so therefore you can get more black people in jail. That's what white supremacism is today. It's a system. And in the film, they break that system down. And I thought that was really necessary because we're living in a time now where we have this growing phenomenon of, of what I call battered Negro syndrome. And I did a video about that a while back. And I think it was like uh, 15 minutes long. I intended for it to be short and sweet, like nine minutes, but I ended up running like 15 minutes, I think. But I really could have gone on for an hour because it's such a convoluted you know, such a, a, a convoluted situation with that and that thought process. This mentality that certain black people have that black people should blame themselves for the systemic ills they suffer in American society. It's our own fault. They say we shouldn't get mad at the system. We should be mad at ourselves for doing X because X is wrong with us and Y is wrong with us and black people shouldn't do this and black people shouldn't do that. And it's funny because they think they're being strong when they're actually just repeating racist mantras created for the purposes of absolving racist authorities and, and, and misdirecting black outrage in on itself instead of on the proper target. Because black people, if you really want to fix the problem, here's just five things that you should think about doing. 
Here's number five. And if, if, if this doesn't apply to you, if you're not doing this, then it doesn't apply to you. I'm not talking about you. Here's number five. Pull up your pants. Some people. Many black people were wearing suits while they were swinging the trees. So you can't dress your way up out of white supremacy. But this documentary, Hidden Colors 3, it, it doesn't make any apologies for racism. It's just very honest and straightforward about it. It breaks it down. It gives you the system. It says, this is how the system works. This is what it does. This is what, it, this is what the impact it has on society is, etc., etc. And it just lays it out. It, it does a good job of breaking it down point by point. I think the subtitle of the of the documentary is is um the rules of racism, yeah the, yeah the rules of racism. So it breaks it down into these rules, the the rules of how systemic racism is executed, and the timing of this movie was great. In this in this post -tray, post Trayvon Martin society we're living in now, where where blackness is being attacked and disrespected at a level that I've never really seen before. I mean, I'm not old enough to have experienced the '70s or 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 the pre-civil rights movement or anything like that but just comparing it to my lifetime I'm seeing a downward shift where 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 lines that were respected before get crossed almost nonchalantly now and I, and I think that's what the Trayvon Martin story was really about like I think my personal theory is that the Trayvon Martin story was used as like a sociological experiment to see where race relations currently are in the country like to, to see if we'd gotten to the point yet where the black segment of society was conditioned and subdued enough that the dominant society could like be more comfortable with, with its racism now without fear of any real repercussion. To check and see if like what the current limitations are in terms of how flagrant you can be. And, and you'll notice now you, you see in the media that people are talking greasier and greasier about black people now. And a lot of times now they hire Uncle Toms and Coons to say these things because they're black. I mean, there have always been Coons, but not like what's going on now. Like back in the day, you really only had a Coon here or there. It was like, who? Like Armstrong Williams, he was he was the main one. And you had like um, Larry Elder. Those were like the go-to Coons. If you, if you needed some Cooning done, you could always count on Armstrong Williams to, to, to come through in the clutch. But today, since white supremacism is making such a push, there's so many coons now, I've lost track. Because using coons is another way to hide it and keep it invisible. And not all white people are like, are like malicious racists, so they aren't, they aren't, those who aren't, they're going to get offended by some of the white supremacist philosophies too. So having them come out of a black person's mouth helps make these white supremacist talking points um, more, socially, more socially acceptable and more, and more, um, more palatable. Fox News has a whole stable of Uncle Toms. I, I used to think they were just finding them somewhere, but they have so many now that I think Fox is actually growing these motherfuckers in the back of their main office building or something. Like, like coon crops. Like they plant them, they water them, and when they're ripe, they just put a suit on them and, and place the coon on the panel for one of their, for one of their shows. It's getting crazy, so, so yeah, we, we definitely needed a, a Hidden Colors 3 at this time. It, it's something to help intellectually and psychologically arm people for what's happening now and what will what will continue to happen in the future I really wish it could have played in theaters more than once because you really can't duplicate that theater experience but but since it can only show once I hope a lot and I mean a lot of people a lot of people buy the DVD and spread it around it, and if you're conscious of, of sociological history you can watch Hidden Colors 3 and take it in but a lot of people who don't know and don't really understand how deep this system goes, some of this documentary may be so shocking to them that they probably will need to see it more than once because like the first time they see it, the discussion may seem so strange and unheard of to them that they might not be able to fully absorb it because you just don't see things like this spoken of in the mainstream. So I hope Hidden Colors 3 becomes one of those staple, staple type movies that everyone sees at some point or knows about. Um, I give Tariq Nasheed all the respect in the world for putting this together and and and, and, and big timing it by getting it into the theater. And and he's a hustler too, man. I I've been listening to some of Tariq's podcasts. Or is it a podcast or is it a radio show? But anyway, I've I've been listening to some of his podcasts and he's been hustling Hidden Colors hard for like months. I mean, it seemed like no matter what the conversation was, he find a reason to bring it up. 
you know, like somebody will call up and say something like, um, "Yo, Tariq, my girlfriend, my girlfriend uses uses ammonia to clean the floor, but I prefer I prefer pine saw." And Tariq will say something like, "Well, cleaning floors is a sign of subservience. That's why you often see black women cast as maids." I talk about that in Hidden Colors three. <laughs> I was like, damn! How did that nigga get Hidden Colors three out of that shit? <laughs> so, <laughs> I hope a lot of people support it, and I hope this documentary blows up, which I think it probably it probably will be pretty big because, um, from what I know, all the Hidden Colors have done fairly well, but they're not you know they're not household names. I hope Hidden Colors three becomes a household thing, which is which is possible because it has some some pretty decent names in it. Uh, David Banner is in it Nas is in it um, Paul Mooney is in it so you know but anyway um, that's all I want to say about it I think it comes out and comes out on the 4th of July so if you didn't see it in theaters or even if you did see it in theaters seriously think about buying that DVD I think it's pretty much a must have in this day and age so uh, I'll holler at y'all later. Peace.